Hey YouTube, Ethan here. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the geothermal power plant in Oxygen Not Included, and more specifically, how to build the geothermal power plant without your duplicates coming in contact with the magma or releasing it into your base. This can be a very intimidating factor for new players on building the geothermal power plant. But when you see the solution to this, I'm sure you will be shocked at how easy it actually is. Before we get into the video, yes, I am using sandbox mode for this playthrough. This is a sandbox asteroid that I do most of my tutorials on. This tutorial will show you how to build the geothermal power plant without the use of sandbox mode, meaning my duplicates will be doing all of the building that is critical in building the geothermal power plant when it comes to dealing with the extreme temperatures. So, first of all, why would you want to build a geothermal power plant in the first place? The geothermal power plant is very useful because it's easy to build, it requires zero maintenance or upkeep, and there is no downtime as you would have with volcanoes or vents because of dormancy periods. It will continue operating your geothermal power plant for the entire playthrough. The core principle of the geothermal power plant is to heat up steam to have it consumed by the aqua tuners, which will release power back into your main electrical grid. This is the same as any other classic steam turbine and aqua tuner combo that you'll use throughout your playthrough for taming volcanoes or geysers or vents. The simple aqua tuner steam turbine combo in this scenario is scaled up to match the power requirements of your colony. And of course, you need the steam turbine aqua tuner combo because without the aqua tuners, the steam turbines would get too hot and they would stop producing power for your electrical grid. If you find other ways of cooling your steam turbines, that's perfectly fine. But in my opinion, the simplest way to do this is to simply use the aqua tuners because you can put these right in the steam room and there's no consequence to them except for the power requirements. This means that there are ways that you can make this power plant more efficient by eliminating the use of aqua tuners, which in turn will help you put more power back into your electrical grid that is not being used to cool the steam turbines. But for this scenario, I'm only going to focus on this combination in order to get the power plant up and running so you can build it yourself and make adjustments as you need to. The limiting factor to the size of your power plant will be how much steel you can produce because the majority of the components that you'll be using will be made out of steel. Steel for the power plant infrastructure is critical in making this power plant last for your entire playthrough. Let's take a look at the various chambers of the power plant and how they all work together. First, I have my steam turbine chamber. This chamber will need to be actively cooled so they can continuously run at 100% efficiency. If they are not running at full capacity, then there's something wrong and the power plant essentially becomes useless because it needs to be able to generate more power than the aqua tuners are using in order for the power plant to be useful. The steam turbine room is flooded with hydrogen gas, which helps disperse the cooling from the radiant liquid pipes that the aqua tuners are cycling through. You definitely want to have some sort of atmosphere in this room to help disperse the heat and that will also allow you to cool the large power transformers that are also in this room without having to run the cooling pipes directly over top of them. In this scenario, I'm using two aqua tuners, and I think this is a bit overkill, but I'm showing the two aqua tuners just so you can see that there's different methods of cooling and with different liquids. It's very common to use crude oil for this type of cooling as it's readily available right next to where you would normally build a power plant like this. However, ethanol will work just fine, as would polluted water. You can also see that we're using two different pipe configurations with the radiant liquid cooling pipes. On the right, I have the radiant liquid pipes running uninterrupted across all the steam turbines, and on the left, I have the running only between the steam turbines with insulated liquid pipes in between. Both methods seem to generate the same result as the temperature balance from the right side of the base is not too much different than the left side of the base. In fact, it's practically the same thanks to the hydrogen gas that helps disperse the heat. For my power distribution, I'm using large power transformers which allow me to run conductive wire in this configuration. In most builds, I would use the heavy watt conductive plate to join between two chambers because usually I wouldn't be too worried about the amount of heat transfer that is happening. But in this case, the steam room has a significantly higher temperature than the steam turbine room does. And because the main priority in this power plant is to cool the steam turbine room, I don't want to make it any harder for my aqua tuners to have to work in order to achieve this, because this means I have to have more aqua tuners built to accommodate a larger steam turbine room. So by using large power transformers, I can run conductive wire through the walls of the steam room and not have to rely on the joint conductive plate and worry about it transferring too much heat to places that I don't want it to transfer the heat to. And that brings us down to our steam room. Our steam room will be constantly running between 200 and 250 degrees depending on which part of the steam room you're at. Both aqua tuners inside the steam room have to be built out of steel in order to withstand these temperatures. This also includes the metal tiles that are built at the bottom of the steam room. This is what's going to be transferring the heat into the water to create the steam. Right below the floor of the steam room, we have steel mechanized airlocks. These are going to hit incredible temperatures of over 400 degrees and even higher depending on how your power plant is built. 
built. The bottom floor of the steam room is built out of metal tiles, which allows the heat to transfer to the water, thus creating the steam. The mechanized airlock, when it's open, prevents heat transfer from happening from the bottom metal tiles, which is getting exposed to very hot temperatures from the magma down below. When the thermal sensor detects that the temperature in the steam room has dropped below a certain number, it will send a red signal and close the mechanized airlocks. Once the mechanized airlocks close, it will create more heat transfer between the bottom tile that is exposed to the magma and the top tile that is exposed to the steam room. This helps keep the steam room at a relatively steady temperature in order to keep the steam turbines working at maximum efficiency. It's a pretty simple concept and a pretty easy setup. This separate chamber where we have the mechanized airlocks currently has carbon dioxide that is heated up to extreme temperatures, over 500 degrees Celsius in this case. So what does this mean for our build? This means that if we had this area completely vacuumed out, the mechanized airlocks in this area would be operating much more in order to keep the steam room at a more constant temperature. Because we don't have it vacuumed out, the carbon dioxide is helping to transfer some of that heat over to the metal tiles, which is helping to heat the steam room. I decided to keep the carbon dioxide in here when I built this in sandbox mode to showcase that it can be done and it works perfectly fine with the carbon dioxide atmosphere. In the second power plant that we build, we're going to vacuum it out completely so we can compare how the two operate. Finally, we get to our heat source at the very bottom. This is a pretty simple concept where we simply build metal tiles that come in contact with the extremely hot abyssalite or even the magma. Being in contact with the magma is sometimes unnecessary because as you can see these steam turbines are constantly running at 100% even though I only have one section of the metal tiles being completely in contact with the magma at all. This is because the abyssalite that is below the surface is also extremely hot albeit not as hot as the magma. This heat from the abyssalite is more than sufficient to keep your power plant running at maximum capacity. In my opinion, it's also a lot easier to build the power plant if you're not worried about a spillover from the magma. But regardless of this, I'm going to show you both methods on how to build it with or without magma exposure with your duplicates. For comparison's sake, let's take a look at the temperatures that we're experiencing when we're not in contact with the magma to when we are. These metal tiles on the far left are not in contact with magma and they're about five spaces away from the nearest magma. Even still, the metal tiles are about 1000 degrees Celsius, and they're about 700 to 800 degrees at the very top, which helps the steam room tiles ultimately end up around 200 to 300 degrees Celsius, depending on if the mechanized airlocks are closed or not. If we compare this to the metal tiles that are in contact with the magma, they get up to about 1300 degrees Celsius constantly. The top metal tiles end up around 1000 degrees Celsius. This is very close to the 800 degrees Celsius that the tiles on the far left are experiencing that are not in contact with the magma at all. And this translates to the steam room tiles being relatively the same temperature, between 200 and 300 degrees Celsius, depending on if the mechanized airlock doors are closed or not. So much like the argument of atmosphere versus no atmosphere, abyssalite contact versus magma contact is also a trivial argument in my opinion. You can make this power plant work perfectly fine without any magma exposure. So it's something that you can decide when you're doing your own power plant build. It is certainly easier to build the power plant if you're not considering magma exposure, simply because it takes a lot less time. It's also worth mentioning that just like you're going to need copious amounts of steel in order to build this power plant to the size that you prefer, you're also going to need a ton of ceramic in order to provide the enclosure to keep the heat from escaping from the power plant. Obviously, the heat that's going to be generated by the magma and the abyssalite is going to be something that you don't want spreading around your base, even if it's not directly attached to your main living quarters, because this will heat up your colony's atmosphere very quickly. So ceramic is going to be your best friend when you make this build, but if you don't have access to all the ceramic that is required, you can still make insulated tiles out of whatever material you prefer, as long as you have a vacuum seal between a separate insulated tile that is protecting your main atmosphere. And this is a visual example of what I'm talking about. Having one type of insulated tile and another type of insulated tile separated by a vacuum will completely stop all heat transfer from occurring. This may be an easier option if you don't have the ceramic in hand in order to build a geothermal power plant to your liking. Because you can create your insulated tiles out of sandstone and then just create a vacuum seal in between. So let's get into how we're going to build the geothermal power plant with our duplicants. The first thing you'll want to do is clear out all the crude oil that will be present in this area, as it usually is when you dig down to the very bottom of your asteroid. In this case, I've simply used sandbox mode to destroy it, and I got rid of all the other tiles such as igneous rock, granite, or lead that may be present on top of the abyssalite. You'll want to dig all the way down to the abyssalite right before the abyssalite starts to get to very hot temperatures. To build the geothermal power plant without exposing our duplicants to all of this heat, we're going to start from the top to bottom. The easiest thing to do would be to find an area that is relatively level so you don't need to have very large pillars extending down which would require a lot of material. I'm going to fast forward and use sandbox mode to build the infrastructure that's not in contact with the extreme heat temperatures that our duplicants will be building. 
So I've gone ahead and built the power plant that I'm going to be using for this demonstration. This is very similar, but I did make some significant changes to the overall layout so we can test how it would work in a different configuration. More notably, the pillars that are going to be used to contact with the very hot abyssalite and magma are no longer going to be a tunnel shape, just going to go straight into the magma and the abyssalite. The entire atmosphere where the pillars are that perform the heat transfer is also completely vacuumed out as is the entire atmosphere where the mechanized airlocks are. I've loaded the aqua tuner chamber with water and I'm only using one aqua tuner this time for six steam turbines. I've also decided to use two thermal sensors, one for each side of the steam room, and they're both connected to five mechanized airlocks. The steam turbine room is once again filled with oxygen and it includes the power transformers that are going to be used to sink the conductive wire around to avoid using the heavy walk conductive joint plate. This is about as far as you can go before you start getting into the serious heat transfers. You can see that I left enough room here for duplicates to be able to walk past so they can complete the rest of the build. Everything beyond this point is going to deal with building into the very hot abyssalite and magma. I put some steel here for my duplicates so they can build the metal tiles and while those are being mined out the first thing that we want to do is identify how far we have to go down. Obviously we're going to start at the far left otherwise the duplicates would eventually get themselves trapped once we build this metal tile all the way into the hot abyssalite. In this case, I'm trying to expose the abyssalite that's all the way down here, very near the magma. So I'm going to get my duplicates to start digging the top layers out. Before you dig too far down, make sure you get your duplicates to build the extra metal tiles up here. Otherwise, they won't be able to reach it once they start digging out too much of the abyssalite and you're going to need to build ladders. I did this for them in sandbox mode so I can save some time. As Askin starts to expose the hot abyssalite tiles, it's going to get extremely hot here. Now that we've exposed the abyssalite tiles that we want to replace with metal tiles, we can go ahead and do that with our duplicates. I'm going to ask them to build the metal tile in place of this abyssalite, where the adjacent temperatures are nearly 1500 degrees Celsius. As soon as Steve destroys the abyssalite tile that is in contact with the extremely hot abyssalite tiles, he's going to build a metal tile right after. This metal tile that is in contact with the adjacent abyssalite tiles that are at almost 1500 degrees is going to get incredibly hot very quickly. This is going to eventually transfer its heat all the way up to the metal tiles at the very top that are in contact with the mechanized airlocks. Because this entire atmosphere is vacuumed out, it is not transferring the heat into the atmosphere, so it is unable to harm the rest of our colony. The second metal tile that I want to build is going to be right on top of this magma, so we're going to have to mine out the abyssalite just before we reach the magma. Make sure that your duplicates always have a way to get back up and out of here, so you don't accidentally get them trapped. I like to leave them a slope so they're able to get back up when the time comes. One of the mistakes that you don't want to make is leave only one layer of abyssalite between the magma, because this means that you're going to need to expose one of these abyssalite tiles in order to build the metal tile that's at the very bottom. So what we're actually going to do before we mine out this entire abyssalite layer is build another magma tile in place of the abyssalite that's in contact with the magma, and cancel the dig on the abyssalite tile that's right above it. This will allow the adjacent abyssalite tiles to keep the magma from rupturing through and causing a big mess in your colony. So we're going to watch Steve as he handles this dig and the subsequent builds of the metal tiles. You can see now that the dig is complete that all that's left to do is the metal tile that is going to be in contact with the magma. The diagonal adjacent empty square will allow the duplicates to gain access to it to destroy the abyssalite and build the metal tile. And here comes Steve right now to do that. As you can see, this is a very simple technique. Once this metal tile is built, we can safely mine out the abyssalite that's on top of it, and we can have our duplicates complete the rest of this stem. In this case, I'm just going to do this in standbox mode. Building your metal tiles deeper into the magma is totally unnecessary, because as you can see, the metal tile that is directly in contact with the magma is already plenty hot enough. But just for fun, I'm going to show you how to build into the magma in case that's what you want to do. In order to achieve this, the first thing that we have to do is request a second metal tile to be built right next to the metal tile that's already in contact with the magma that we want to build. And then we're going to request to dig out the adjacent diagonal abyssalite tile. Once this tile is dug out, then the metal tile inside the magma can be safely built. Subsequently, we're going to dig out the second abyssalite tile that is now in between the magma and the metal tile, which will allow the metal tile farther into the magma to be also built. And here comes Steve to do just that. Once this metal tile is built, we can request for that abyssalite tile to be dug out. Now once that tile is dug out, my duplicates have access to the metal tile inside of the magma. And here comes Steve to finish it off. 
I guess Steve had other things to worry about, and here comes Quinn to build the metal tile. And that's all there is to it. This is all you need to do in order to build inside of the magma. You can continue this exact same technique to build as low as you want into the magma, and if your area surrounding it is vacuumed out, your duplicants will have an incredibly easy time in navigating this atmosphere. The magma is not nearly as intimidating as it seems. Just with those two pillars in contact with the abyssalite and the magma, we're already generating enough heat in order to turn the water that I originally had in the steam room into steam. It's not quite hot enough yet in order to start producing steam for the steam turbines to produce power for us. So let's continue and build the rest of the pillars. We've completed the rest of our pillars in sandbox mode and the power plant is starting to come to life. The water has all but turned into steam and the steam turbines are starting to generate power. My aqua tuner is working overtime to keep the polluted water cold enough in order to keep the steam turbines cold and my thermo sensors are opening and closing the mechanized airlocks in order to provide the heat transfer needed to keep the steam room at operating temperature. As the result of us taking the heat out of the magma, some of it has turned into igneous rock at the very bottom. In my experience, this is not something that you have to worry about because the igneous rock still maintains much of its heat and the surrounding magma will help keep it warm. You can see the same effect happening in the original power plant that I built, where much of the magma has turned into igneous rock, but it is still maintaining around 1300 degrees Celsius, as it is getting heat from the adjacent magma. As the steam room comes up to temperature and the steam turbines come up to full power, you can make necessary adjustments to your steam room in order to delete steam or add more steam if needed. This can be done using the output water pipes of each steam turbine. For example, if there is not enough steam, you can add more water into the steam chamber by using these water pipes and adding water from an external source. If for whatever reason there is too much steam, you can divert the water that's coming out of the steam turbines, which over time will delete the steam volume inside of the steam chamber. As you can see within about one or two cycles, these steam turbines will come up to full power. And I'm using one aqua tuner with polluted water inside the pipes to keep them cold. Fast forwarding a few cycles ahead, and you can see that the power plant is now working at 100% efficiency. You'll also notice that because of the lack of atmosphere where the mechanized airlock tiles intersect with the steam room tiles, that the mechanized airlock tiles will be working much more in order to keep the temperature at a constant level. If we watch both power plants working side by side, you can see that the differences in the builds are not dramatic enough in order to cause them to function completely differently. In both cases, the metal tiles that were in contact with the magma cooled the magma down enough to turn it into igneous rock. The heat is still able to transfer into the steam room to keep the turbines running at 100% efficiency. In fact, if you look at the cycle clock and compare it to where I started this build, you can see that the igneous rock didn't take very long to solidify at all. However, all the heat is still present that is needed to make the steam turbines work at 100% capacity. This is why I didn't put too much emphasis at the beginning beginning and being in contact with the magma, as the very hot abyssalite will work just fine in most cases. Taking a look at our plumbing overlay, the polluted water seems to be holding up just fine in order to cool the steam turbines. It's leaving the aqua tuner at around 24 degrees and re-entering at around 38 degrees. If you do need to get back into the steam room for whatever reason, you're going to need to build a liquid lock, but keep in mind that whatever you decide to build your liquid lock out of, it's going to have to withstand the temperatures of the steam, which is around 200 degrees Celsius. So you'll have to use something like crude oil or petroleum that won't instantly evaporate and cause your liquid lock to fail. Both thermal sensors send a green signal if the temperature is 200 degrees Celsius or higher. As soon as it sends a red signal, the doors will close and it'll help facilitate more heat transfer into the steam room. And there you have it, the geothermal power plant and how to build it in oxygen not included. The geothermal power plant itself is quite easy to build, as the steam turbine and aqua tuner combo is fairly common in various other parts of the game, so you can just borrow the same design and scale it up to your needs for the power generation that you want. If you like this tutorial, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. Also, if you have any questions, or if something wasn't clear enough, or alternatively, if you have any suggestions on how to make this build better for other players that come across this video, feel free to leave that down below as well. And if you were able to learn something, be sure to give the video a rating, as this helps me out a lot in getting the video to more people in the algorithm. I hope that you were able to learn something, and that you'll consider subscribing for more videos in the future. And with that, I'm Ethan, and I'll see you in the next one.